Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program, Coming to America. My name is Melissa Dalton, and I am the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Greene County Records and Archives. Today, we're going to be learning about immigration in the United States. We're going to look at particularly uh, two individuals in a later program who actually came and settled here in Greene County. But before we get into the program, I'd like to just give you a little bit of information about our facility. The Greene County Records Center of Arch Archives was founded in 1996, but our records actually date back to 1803. Greene County was actually established in 1803, the same year that Ohio gained statehood. And Greene County originally went all the way up to Lake Erie, and it wasn't until 1819 that it got its current borders. So actually, Greene County is one of the oldest counties in Ohio. Now, the types of records that you will find in our facility will include things like the probate records, which would be estates, wills, marriage, adoptions, birth, death records. We also have clerk of court records, which would include divorce, um, early naturalizations, which that will be some of the records we cover today, um, criminal cases, civil disputes. We also have tax records, deeds, mortgages, survey records. We have a great deal of maps, and that's just a small percentage of what we've got. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about immigration. So before we get into that, I want you guys to take a moment and discuss what is immigration? What does it mean to be an immigrant? So immigration is really just um, what one person moving from one country to live into another. So they're going to take up permanent residence in this new country. It's going to be their new home. So let's keep that in mind as we move through the program today. Let's look at this world map. Now thinking about immigration in the United States, today we're going to be really focusing on the late 1800s, early 1900s. And we wanted to just kind of point out some places that people have immigrated from here to the United States. So I want you guys to take a few minutes, press pause, and talk about, do you, talk about where your ancestors are from. And you guys can discuss and see if there's similarities and um, see if, there, if you guys are from all over the world, if there's a lot of you from a particular region. So take a few moments and have a discussion. Now let's check your geography skills. This is, these are some present day photographs of places from around the world. And we want to see if you can guess where they are. So take a few minutes and think about the first. So top left and then the top right, the bottom left and the bottom right. So take a few minutes and get your guesses out there and I'll come back and let you guys know. All right, did you guys get them right? So we have China, which is the top left, Mexico, which is the top right, Russia is the bottom left, that's actually Moscow, Moscow, and the bottom right is Ireland. So how did you guys do? So when we think about migration, it's important to talk about the reasons for migration. So why are some reasons people would leave their home country and move to another one? So take a few moments and discuss it as a class. So one reason could have been work. At, remember, we're thinking about the, or we're, we're really focusing on the late 1800s, early 1900s. And at that time, there was a lot of job opportunity in the United States. So there was growth in industry, there was westward, westward expansion. So there was gonna be a lot of job opportunities. Another reason might be war. If your home country is experiencing war, a lot of people were trying to escape that environment and find a new, a new home. There also could be natural disaster. So if we want to put it in maybe a context that it was relatable today, you could think of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. There were a lot of people who were displaced, who lost their homes, and they had to leave 
the island and a lot of them did leave and left permanently. Another reason could be religious freedom. So we have on this slide um, people practicing Jewish faith and we also have another one of a bunch of people in a church that's actually Roman Catholic faith. So people might have been leaving their home country because they weren't able to practice the religion that they wanted to. And the last one could be government. And this is really a big one. So let's think about what type of government do we have here in the United States? We have a representative democracy. So what does that mean? That means that we elect leaders who we believe are going to represent our interest in the government. So you're usually going to, you're going to vote for people you believe have similar morals and values as you do. And that there's that concept of for the people, by the people. And when we think about other types of governments, there are usually two more that people think of most frequently. Do you know what they are? So maybe a monarchy and a dictatorship. So monarchy, I think a good example could be Great Britain. Now today, Great Britain actually has what they call a constitutional monarchy. So instead of having a queen or king, you have um, just the king or queen. You now have a parliament. So they're kind of like the equivalent of our Congress. And they're the ones who actually make and pass the laws and legislation. Whereas now the queen, she's still the head of the state, but she doesn't have any power. Now a dictatorship is where one person has all the power. So they can make whatever laws and rules they want without input from anybody else. So something to think about is why would people want a democracy then? What would, what's appealing about a democracy? There were a lot of people who felt that a democracy, they were going to be able to have a voice. They were gonna have a way to have their voice heard within their government. So that was really appealing to a lot of people. So let's now talk about the journey itself. Remember, we're talking about the late 1800s, early 1900s. And during that time, people traveled by boat to get to America. And the one thing they needed to get access to that boat was a ticket. And those tickets could be very expensive. And some people saved for years to buy a ticket. And it's also important to note here that a lot of times it wasn't the whole family coming at once. So maybe your father came first and got settled, got a job, um, got a home set up, and then he sent money home to your mother, and then you and your siblings came over with your mother later. But it was also possible that maybe you had older siblings who weren't going to make the journey, or grandparents, or cousins and aunts. So it was a really difficult decision for a lot of people to make, knowing that maybe they wouldn't see family for a very long time. So when you got on the boat, there were usually several levels. Most people think of like first class and second class. Um, and the boat though, for, for this trip, for this journey, most immigrants were kept in the bottom of the boat and they called that the steerage. And they weren't really allowed to leave the steerage. You kind of stayed in your, in your spot the whole time. So it's not like a cruise ship where you're up and walking about. So you had to stay there. And this journey itself could take anywhere from two to four weeks. So think about, think about that. You're going to be stuck in a boat in a small space, potentially very small space, for two to four weeks. And what happens when people are in tight quarters for a long time? without a lot of access to, to fresh air and that sort of thing. Disease, disease spreads very easily. So people get sick very easily. And a lot of people did get sick on these journeys and there were some who never made it to the United States. Now let's think about the ports. 
there were two main ports that most people think of in the United States. One is Ellis Island, which is located where? New York. And there's Angel Island. Anybody know where that's located? San Francisco. Now most people think of Ellis Island. Ellis Island was open from 1892 to 1954. And between those years, roughly 12 million immigrants entered the United States. But at Ellis Island, as soon as they exited the boat, they were being tested. So when they got off the ship, they were instructed to climb a set of stairs with their luggage. And there was a doctor that stood at the top of the stairs watching them. And they had a piece of chalk in their hand. So let's say that the doctor noticed that somebody had something going on with their eye. They put an E on their shoulder. Or maybe somebody had a limp, put an L on their shoulder. Or maybe somebody was pregnant, they put a PG. So anybody who had a marking on their shoulder had to be examined further. So like I said, maybe they had an eye infection or they had a limp. And so if they determined that their, their illness wasn't severe, they, they would just quarantine them. So they would separate them from everybody else and, and make sure that they, were, they got better. But if they decided it was a more serious illness, they could be sent back. So although most people were made it through this whole process within a few hours, there were some who never set foot on American soil, and they were sent home. So although some knew Ellis Island as the Island of Hope, others, it became known as an Island of Tears. So let's talk a little bit about Angel Island. Angel Island was open from 1910 to 1943. And between those years, roughly 175,000 Asian immigrants entered the United States. But this was a really different experience than Ellis Island, as it was actually a, dis a detention facility, which meant people were automatically detained as soon as they came into the United States. And they could be kept there from anywhere from two weeks. And some people were kept there as long as six months. And there are actually a few instances where people were kept there, were actually forced to live there for two years. Because at Angel Island, you had to have people act as witnesses for you to say that you were a good person and that you weren't going to be a burden on society. And to find these people to act as witnesses could be really difficult because people were worried that if you got in trouble, then as because they acted as a witness for you, they could also get in trouble and they could lose their citizenship or be sent back to the, their country. So it was really difficult to have people um, act as witnesses. I want you guys to think about that last image you saw in the slideshow. You have a bunch of people exiting the boat and they're all just carrying one suitcase. So I want you to take a few minutes and discuss what kind of items are people going to bring with them. So think outside the box, not just your normal everyday items, but other things that maybe hold value to people. So take a minute, press pause and discuss. So let's look at this suitcase. So we have picked some items that or maybe a little outside of your ordinary. These aren't, we don't have clothes or anything like I'm sure many of you said, but we do have other items. So you're gonna have photographs. So you have family members, okay? So maybe siblings, your siblings, maybe they're not making the journey, okay? So you want those mementos, you want to be able to remember them. Because it's possible that you may not see them for a very long time. Maybe your grandmother, Especially if she's older, she's, she might not feel like she's in the best condition. Maybe she, she does have some health issues or she just feels she's too advanced in age to, to make that journey. So maybe she stays behind, okay? So you want these reminders of your family. Maybe extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, okay? Same idea, you might not see them for a while. So you want to remember your family members. 
something else, especially school-aged children, it's quite possible that maybe your parents want you to remember and to continue your studies in your native language. So maybe you're from Germany and they want you to continue learning your German. So this is actually a German workbook. So maybe they had you do the, these studies at home, outside of the classroom, okay? Something else, depending on your religious beliefs, or if your family had religious beliefs, maybe you brought something like a Bible. So and things that are interesting, this is actually a German Bible, by the way. Things that are interesting about Bibles is that a lot of times people would document their family history in the front of the book or in the back of the book. So they write now names, dates of birth, who people, who got married to whom, all of that, all that stuff. Okay. So it could also hold a lot of value to you for your own personal history. Okay. And let's say you brought things that hold sentimental value. So maybe you are, maybe you had a favorite song or, or these are actually records, a favorite record, or maybe you were like somebody we're gonna learn about shortly and you were really into music. So you brought some records or some sort of form of music with you that reminded you of home. And lastly, today, if you're traveling outside of the country, you're gonna need a passport. Now, the passports back then weren't nearly the same, or they were different than they are today. But this is actually the passport of our former archivist, and she's actually British. So this is her canceled passport for several years ago. So this is something you're gonna to need today to travel. You can see all her different stamps. She traveled a lot back and forth. Well, she still does actually. <laughs> so those are just some of the items that people probably brought with them. So let's go ahead and move on to the activity. So we'll see you shortly. So now that we've gone through this program, I would like to take some time to just introduce you to our activity we're going to do. And we want to learn about two immigrants who made the journey. We're going to learn about Marie Truer and Amos Mazzolini. So you have to open up the activity separately. So hope to see you there. We hope you enjoyed this first part of our program. If you would like to learn about other programs we have available, please check out our website. We have a student resources page and an educators page, which lists the other programming. We also do a weekly blog post, so you can learn about prominent peoples of Green County, um, different events and places throughout the county. We also have an online presence on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we also have our Flickr page, which has images of to different types of records. So we hope you'll check some of those out and we look forward to seeing you at the activity.